Welcome to Strategy Talk, where the editors of Strategy Page discuss current events with a splash of history. I'm Dan Masterson, host of Strategy Talk. With me today is today is the editor of Strategy Page, well-known military author and game designer Jim Dunnigan. Also joining us is the associate editor of Strategy Page, columnist and author Austin Bay. Welcome, Austin and Jim. Thought it would be a good time with uh, everything going on to talk about uh, Iran and their proxy wars that they've they've run for the last uh, three or four decades. Um, they're finally being called to task for it by uh, somebody other than the Israelis. Uh, Jim, what has prompted the United States to come out so strongly against Iran recently? Well, we're not coming out so strongly against them. Uh, we're simply enforcing agreements that we made with them. <laughs> uh, you know, the uh, you know, of course, the Iran, that's their playbook. Anything we do against them is considered, you know, a war crime. Um, and anything they do against anybody else, they didn't do. I mean, a classic example was the recent incident where a rocket was fired. Uh, later, it was determined it came from a, a neighborhood controlled by a Iran-backed uh, militia uh, and landed yeah, about you know a thousand meters or so from the uh, U.S. embassy in the green zone. Uh, Iran condemned it. Obviously, that's how you do proxy war. You let somebody else do the, the, the dirty work for you and then, uh, you know, uh, basically come out against it. Uh, they have done that since forever because it's the classic example of a, a guerrilla warfare. Uh, Iran, since the uh, religious dictatorship took over from the Shah in, in the 1980s, uh, has been fighting at a disadvantage. Uh, they were humiliated in the war that uh, I, you know, Saddam Hussein began when he thought, a big understatement, that he'd take advantage of the disorder in Iran because they were having the, the uh, religious leaders were having trouble uh, making everybody toe the line, as it were, with the new government. Um, and the, the Iran was in disorder. Um, and, of course, uh, the uh, key Iranian oil fields are in what they then called Arabistan, uh, you know, Arab land of the Arabs, as it were, right on the, uh, the, the Iraqi border. And Saddam said, well, hey, this is a swell opportunity to not only grab their oil fields and then hold them for ransom or whatever, um, but also to uh, assert, uh, you know, authority over the Shat al Arab. That's a waterway uh, between the two countries, which is along that in dispute. Uh, and this is an enormously popular thing with Arabs in general. Um, to humiliate the Persians, because the Persians have been doing the, uh, you know, uh, handing out the humiliation for thousands of years, literally. I mean, they've been, they've been, how should I put it, a problem for everyone in the in the neighborhood, uh, for as long as there's written history and probably before it. Um, the uh, Arabs, you know, thought wrong. <laughs> the uh, Iranians quickly pulled it together, but. Not so much that they were able to just roll over the Arabs as they had done in the past, because the uh, Iraqis uh, looked to their, you know, uh, their brethren, as it were, in the rest of Arabia and said, look, if they get us, which it was understood they could, the Iranians could, they're going to come after you next. Uh, and that would be a perfect excuse, you know, to, um, how should I put it, uh, get justice for the for Iran. Uh, and so the uh, I, I, you know the Saudis and the Kuwaitis in particular, uh, well either loaned or gave uh, Iraq you know tens of billions of dollars over the next you know five or six years uh, to basically uh, you know fund the war. Uh, one of the major expenses that should be pointed out during that war was to encourage the majority of the Iraqi troops who were Shia Arabs and not Sunnis uh, to fight and die. Uh, basically, uh, Saddam uh, started the uh, the custom of paying the uh, large cash payments to the families uh, or sometimes just giving them automobiles or other, some other, you know, uh, I should have put high value uh, compensation uh, to the families of uh, Shia uh, Iraqi uh, uh, soldiers who were killed in combat. Now, he was taking advantage of the fact that while there's the religious angle, 
uh, Iran is the is the majority, you know, Shia country in the world, and uh, it's a minority uh, 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 Islamic sect uh, that the Iranians are the major proponent of. Um, the Arabs in uh, in Iraq who are Shia are basically Arabs first, and that annoys you know uh, I Iran, but that's basically their own fault. Anyway, the war was a stalemate and a huge humiliation uh, for Iran. Uh, and, uh, and in the aftermath, of, in, in the aftermath of the uh, 2003 invasion of Iraq, which finally brought Hussein down, doing the uh, Iranians a huge favor, there were Iranians joking in Iran that, gee, wouldn't it be great if the Americans invaded Iran and deposed our government as well? That did not go over well with the religious dictatorship. Uh, they had been basically fuming and plotting ever since. Uh, they basically are going to have gone to war with the uh, Sunni Arab majority in Arabia uh, and are talking openly about, you know, taking back Iraq, taking Kuwait, uh, taking Bahrain. These are all lost provinces. I mean, that was the same rhetoric that Saddam used when he took Kuwait. Poor Kuwait. They're stuck in the middle. Um, but... That ha that happens when you live in, an, in a you know in a bad neighborhood. Uh, the Iranians understand that and they try to take advantage of it, but they realize that because of you know decades of sanctions, their military deteriorated. They in the past, <coughs> historically, they depended on having not only the better trained and motivated troops, but also the better weapons. They, for example, had plate armor. <clears throat> on their, on their, on their, you know, uh, uh, troops, uh, uh, you know, a thousand years before it was adopted in Europe. Uh, you know, the Romans ran into that. Uh, they had a much superior military system. But now, for the first time in history, they're facing Arabs who are better armed than they are. And they were recently, they've recently been humiliated in Yemen, where the American patriot, you know, anti uh Air defense systems, which can also knock down missiles, has knocked down over a hundred of their missiles, uh, which are fired into uh, you know Saudi Arabia uh, in the last oh four years, um, and uh, that's a humiliation they don't talk about. Uh, and indeed, they they try and say, well, these aren't our missiles, although. The UN went in and investigated, looked at all the uh, components of the missiles. I mean, there's always something left over when these things are blown out of the air over the desert. So they the, uh, they go out and uh, you can collect the uh, components. And, and you, when you find a lot of them with uh, Farsi, that's the uh, Iranian language, uh, you know, a script on them, uh, it's fairly obvious where they come from. Also, the designs are, you know, uh, I, you know, obviously Iranian. Uh, they, you know, they, they belong to certain classes of missiles, solid fuel, uh, short range ballistic missiles that the Iranians, you know, publicize as, as, uh, you know, Iranian designs. The Iranians just say it's all a conspiracy against this. Uh, and that's classic proxy war. Uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, which they basically formed in, uh, in the 1980s, uh, they launched some, some horrific uh, proxy attacks against the United States, the Marine Barracks uh, in, in, uh, in, in Beirut, uh, killing over 200 Marines with a, uh, uh, using a Lebanese Hezbollah uh, you know, suicide truck bomber. Uh, Iran, Iran, well, they, they you know, said, hey, we didn't do it, but as time went on, uh, when it was widely accepted that Iran was behind it, they just sort of shrugged their shoulders and knowingly, you know, grin. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? Uh, but officially, they deny capability. That, that they, they deny responsibility, and it's only been recently that Hezbollah has finally been recognized by the UN, which should know better, uh, as an international terrorist organization. Because they, it turned out, the evidence has been piling up for decades, have been behind dozens of attacks and assassinations. Even the Germans, you know, who would do business with the devil if, if they could get away with it, um, uh, uh, have done business with the Iranians, but they've caught, you know, the Iranians assassinating uh, critics I wrote usually Iranian exile critics or Kurds, uh, whoever, uh, in um, 
uh, living in exile in Germany uh, with their, you know, the their not Hezbollah in this case, but Quds Force. I mean, people who were Iranian agents, and and in in some of these cases, they caught Iranian diplomats having uh, meetings. Uh, the Germans, you know, are not happy with that at all. They have enough problems with uh, Islamic uh, uh, terrorism, uh, but to have an, a, a, go- a foreign government officially uh, sending their embassy personnel out, personnel out there to organize these things, you know, is too much even for the Germans. Uh, so, you know, now they have Hezbollah uh, declared international terrorists, um, and uh, Iran finds that its its options are becoming fewer and fewer. The walls, so to speak, are closing in, and they don't like it because what this has ended up producing is internal dissent. For over a year now, there have been uh, continuing and growing in many cases uh, public demonstrations against the government because what's really been killing uh, the uh, the Iranian government is the corruption. You know, they've not only been, been how should I put it, misbehaving uh, to their foreign enemies, but they've been not very uh, kind to their own people. Um, and the corruption has gotten to the, the point where uh, they can't get away with um, blaming, this is proxy, you know, uh, another uh, uh, variation on proxy war, uh, they can no longer blame the sanctions and foreign interference for crippling the economy because it's gotten so bad that it's obvious that it's the corruption uh, which is causing more of the problems. Not only the corruption, but also the foreign wars. Iran got involved in Syria, which turned out to be a big mistake because it's, it's been costing him billions of dollars. And it's been difficult to hide that because they hired – you know, oh, geez, uh, maybe close over 70,000, 80,000 in total over the, the last five years. Uh, foreign mercenaries, uh, including, you know, about twenty or 30,000 Afghan uh, exiles, Afghan Shia mainly, uh, exiles in uh, <laughs> refugees uh, in, I, in Iran, and even some in, um, in Afghanistan, because they were paying very well. Uh, and offering all sorts of benefits. And where was the money coming from? It was coming from money that should have been spent on Iranians who are suffering. I mean, the, the inflation uh, in inside Iran of staple goods has been over 40% in the last year. Now, the only reason for that is because they've mismanaged uh, the uh, their own economy uh, and the Iranian people no longer believe that it's the fall of foreigners. You know, the... Uh, those those hate America rallies they hold every year uh, have people who would uh, have more and more people who would rather be lined up outside an American embassy or the Swiss embassy, whoever's representing them, to try to get you know uh, you know an exit visa or permission to visit the United States and stay there. Um, that annoys the Iranian government as well, but it's their own fault, and they basically run out of people to blame. But they can still uh, carry on these, um, how should I put it, proxy attacks. Uh, but even these are becoming more dangerous because, you know, since our current government came into power in, in 2017, the order immediately went out, uh, no longer, you know, back off uh, when the uh, Iranians, you know, are make a threatening move, usually in, this, in the Persian Gulf where the, the, uh, the, where the uh, large – Speedboats with guys with the RPGs or you know guided missiles and what have you, uh, anti-tank missiles uh, come rolling out and trying to intimidate American warships, uh, and then it immediately stopped because the problem with proxy attacks is if you slap back, they have to stop because if they keep it up at, at that point, they're going to get you know call they are going to get caught. There's going to be plenty of evidence that they are behind it, and that sort of evidence has been slowly. You know, piling up. So they're back into a corner and they have very few moves left. They can't afford a war. In fact, uh, the Israelis told the Americans, uh, and this was not kept a big secret, that no, no, no. The last thing we want is a war either started by, uh, you know, Israel with an airstrike on uh, on Iran or, or Americans, you know, uh, firing, you know, large uh, weapons at the Iranians. Uh because we'd be the first target, the uh, the you know the the number one uh, enemy 
of Iran is considered Israel, uh, which is kind of sad because before the uh, religious government took over, uh, Iran and Israel were on pretty good terms, even though the Arabs were not on good terms with Israel. Now it's changed. Uh, so the uh, you know the the it's understood by both the Americans and the Israelis and the Iranians that nobody wants a real war. But the, if the Iranians don't strike back, as it were, if they don't take uh, an aggressive move uh, to defend their their how should I put it, their point of view, uh, they then become weak to their own people because the Iranians do you know uh, take some pride in these attacks. Uh, you know they like to think that, and it's true that they've been more clever than the Arabs, more successful. But the biggest mistake they made was to, you know, to accept, as it were, a religious dictatorship, because that's basically ruined everything. And uh, the religious dictatorship, uh, you know, with all the, the smart guys, and they do have a lot of smart people working for them, uh, they basically run out of moves. In other words, they're desperate and they're cornered. And that in itself is a dangerous situation. And that's what got, that's what's got everybody wondering, well, what happens next? Probably nothing good. Austin? Well, uh, I'm going to uh, start off by uh, reading part of a statement came, that came from – Reuters identified uh, the State Department official as an unnamed senior State Department official. And uh, this was – this was made, as far as I can tell, let's see, today, we're recording this on May 23rd, probably May 19th, Sunday. <clears throat> we have made clear, this is the, the statement was uh, emailed to Reuters, we have made clear over the past two weeks, and again underscore that attacks on U.S. personnel and facilities will not be tolerated and will be responded to in a decisive manner. We will hold Iran responsible if any such attacks are conducted by its proxy militia forces or elements of such forces and will respond to Iran accordingly. And in a, my latest column, I call that clear and unadorned. I think it is. <laughs> Jim's right. Uh, the U.S., look, we've known for four decades, really, 80s, 90s, first and second decades of the <clears throat> – of this uh, uh, this century, that uh, Iran uses proxy operations. Uh, they do it uh, because the religious dictatorship does realize it's weak uh, in in conventional military terms. I think that's one of the reasons they want a nuclear weapon. It's because the, another way to cover up for their uh, weak economic system uh, and uh, highly deteriorated. Uh, uh, military uh, uh, capabilities and there are also their lack of, of of political attractiveness if if the ayatollah khomeini was cool in 1979 in 2019 the khomeiniist regime is anything but uh, jim mentioned uh, protests going on uh, in iran virtually nonstop that started in the middle of uh, december 2017 and it continues they tried to stomp it out. I mean, the dictatorship initially, uh, but uh, it, it's not 2009 anymore in the Green Movement, which was a mass movement, a peaceful mass movement, even had some members of, of, uh, of the military and the Republican Guards who said, we, we, need, we need to change the way our system works. Well, well, they got broken down and broken apart. And uh, the Obama administration was, it took two months for the Obama administration to say anything tough and hold the Iranian regime responsible for what it was doing to its own people. Now, we can sit and wonder why. But there is evidence that Obama thought that he was going to change the uh, <clears throat> regime's behavior by uh, dealing with it and giving it uh, monetary and uh, trade and even uh, uh, advantages in obtaining uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, of course, it didn't happen. They used the regime, saw him as. Uh, uh, a useful idiot, I guess, to uh, use, uh, uh, use that term. Uh, there is great 
great dissatisfaction in Iran by the Iranian people. It's really not recent. I can go back to the 96 edition of A Quick and Dirty Guide to War. And if you look at the Iran chapter in there, there's a, in the introduction, the question is asked, you know, it's when will the Iranian people move on their own regime? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. We don't know. It's reached a point, though, where it looks like they're willing to spill some of their own blood. And it's reached a point in part because of the economic deterioration, and Jim's made the connection between economic deterioration, corruption, and also prosecuting proxy wars, which have not benefited the Iranian people. It's reached a point on the domestic front that the Ayatollahs and the senior leadership in the uh, Republican Guards, who are their uh, their regime maintenance uh, security unit, uh, know that uh, Jim used the term they're cornered. They're not quite totally trapped in the corner, but uh, they're they know that the, the, the I said dissatisfaction. There's great hatred on their own people for for the regime. Now, as for proxy wars, Jim says uh, classic guerrilla tactic. It really is. You pay somebody, or you attract an ideological uh, someone who is ideologically aligned with you, and uh, terror. Uh, even political uh, political disru- uh, uh, disruption. What Iran began to do, and it really it, this, its success with Lebanese Hezbollah is is really the model that they've been using since the early uh, 1980s. Is in in the case of Lebanese Hezbollah, they were Shia uh, Lebanese Arabs. Down. There's the Shia connection. Sometimes you'll see the notion of a Shia crescent that Iran wanted to uh, obtain, connecting uh, Shia Arabs to Shia Iran, and and going all the way from uh, from uh, our, uh, Iran uh, and connecting to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, a pipe dream, uh, uh, delusion, but that's uh, that has the uh, idea behind it of using, uh, in, th- in this case, their, their sectarian connection of uh, Shia, uh, Shia actors, whether they're uh, Arabs or, or uh, in, in any other ethnic group. But they took Lebanese uh, uh, Hezbollah, which uh, was a radical uh, Islamic organization, but it also had a component of where it was as a a Shia uh, security or protection group in in uh, in the chaos of Lebanon. There were one for Sunnis. The Christians had their own uh, militias. Even the Druze had their uh, own militia. The the Druze group. Group. I'm forgetting Amal. I think was the name. I can't believe I remembered that. I think was was really a well organized uh, uh, outfit. The Iranians came in and gave Lebanese Hezbollah money, provided training, provided better weapons, and over about a, an arc of ten to twelve years, Lebanese Hezbollah became the uh, critical key actor in Lebanon, because nobody else could compete with them. The uh, Saudis tried to pour some money uh, into uh, Sunni organizations. The Israelis backed some of the Sunni and Christian organizations and uh, and Druze. But the Iranians uh, concentrated on Lebanese Hezbollah, and to pay the piper, Lebanese Hezbollah conducted attacks on um, proxy attacks on enemies that Iran uh, uh, on targets that Iranian. How to put this, Jim? Iranian security agents recommended it. That was the way that they would try to uh, plausible deniability, even if it went that uh, that far. They they wanted to make sure there were no overt. Uh, operational uh, connections, even though uh, clearly there were. Uh, And one of the most clearest examples was what 
became known, uh, well, it was known as several things, but uh, colloquially as Rocket Land in southern Lebanon, where the, the uh, militias under Iranian tutelage, Iranian pay, or if not part of Lebanese Hezbollah connected to them, were on a daily basis firing rockets uh, at Israel. The Iranians, uh, even though they're still trying to deny they had any connection with it, and everybody knew that was, that they did because they were Iranian Al Quds special forces uh, trainers and logisticians operating in in Lebanon, the Iranians began to say, "This is our front against the Israelis." Now that's their model. You see, this worked out this same kind of proxy operation with the Houthis in Yemen. Houthis predominantly, really overwhelmingly, belong to a Shia sect. I always mispronounce it, but it's Zayda, and I've heard it pronounced. There's, a, there's another, I won't, I won't try to uh, 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 mess it up uh, uh, again, but the thing is, it's a, it's a Shia Islamic sect. They have, uh, they're in the north, in the hills, uh, they have some legitimate gripes about the, the crookedness of the uh, Yemeni government and, and also uh, the prejudice against uh, Houthis uh, on an ethnic basis as well as a sectarian, a sectarian basis. Uh, there's a little bit of similarity there with the way the uh, Shia Arabs in, in, in Lebanon uh, saw their, uh, their condition. So here come the Iranians, providing them with weapons, assistance. And uh, we've talked about the Iranian smuggling operations with, uh, with the Houthis. But they also use the Lebanon, not Lebanese model. Jim talked about firing short-range ballistic missiles uh, at Saudi targets. I mean, outrageous. Uh, some of them are the, uh, you can't call them uh Medium range or intermediate range ballistic missiles, but they're longer than uh, have longer range than standard SRBMs. They fire them from uh, uh, inside Yemen, and uh, they have enough range to uh, reach uh, Riyadh. That's where we've provided the Saudis with uh, lots of Patriot uh, Pack threes, and uh, as far as I know, every single uh, one of the missiles that the Iranians really have fired. They supply them to the Houthis, but they apparently fired by Iranian technicians. Uh, when they are coming close to a target, uh, can, actually going to reach a target, they've all been intercepted. And you know, the, the Saudis and the Emiratis have, have made a big deal out of this. We've been kind of quiet about, uh, about the success, at least at uh, what I'll say the major media uh, level, even though there's good uh, is coverage of it, but you go and you look look through the military technology uh, publications and, and the like. Uh, it's all over the place about how successful the Pac threes uh, ha have been, and in some uh, cases they're not being manned by uh, by Americans. They're being manned by uh, uh, trained uh, Arab crews. Uh, the the uh, surface air, uh, air missile anti ballistic missile uh, uh, crews. Jim mentioned the uh, ethnic superiority angle that the Iranians uh, carry. Ethnic ethnic bias drives them crazy. <laughs> that Arabs are manning uh, and doing a fabulous job manning anti ballistic missile batteries. Uh, that's another uh, a, another poke at uh, the uh, superiority complex uh, in Tehran that, that, that aggravates the Arabs that they've been treated that way for millennia, uh, and it upsets the Iranians now that they got into another big war, expensive war, in, uh, in Yemen that they can't win. And that uh, the Arabs are slowly getting, and I said the Arab coalition, the Saudi coalition, it's not all just uh, uh, Arabs, are slowly getting a win in Yemen. But uh, to, to, to get, get back to my uh, Lebanon uh, analogy, Yemen was the back door, is the back door to Saudi Arabia, and that was their other front against the Arabs. 
So the idea was is that if we're going to use these proxy forces, which we deny that we're connected to, and they'll attack the uh, Gulf Arabs, whom we hate. They'll attack the Israelis, whom we hate. And they'll also launch attacks, because I don't think these were tied to Lebanese Hezbollah. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but attacks in um, um, Romania. Also, I think one in Bulgaria that were traced <coughs> to uh, Lebanese Hezbollah. The uh, Iranians launched attacks on on, uh, dis, uh, on dissidents. This was uh, maybe a, de- uh, a decade ago. Now, those are, that's terror attacks, but it's also proxy saying where the Iranians uh, government says the regime says, oh, it's not us. And yet everybody knows it, it really is uh, is you. Uh, it's come to the point. I read the State Department uh, 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 statement uh, and uh, the it, 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 here's the one other thing I, I'll say to it. It's I, the Iranian regime is at a very in a very, very fragile uh, place domestically and internationally when the U.S. State Department is telling them they're going to be held responsible for attacks by their proxies. Here's another reason why, Dan, is because they're proxy forces. You don't always have control over proxy forces. So the scenario that's possible is that Iran – Okay, I'll, I'll be a little bit out there. Uh, loses um, <clears throat> Bandar al-Abbas to a massive bombing raid because uh, one of their proxy uh, forces launched uh, uh, a suicide boat attack on an, on an American destroyer in the Red Sea. And they were told not to, but it didn't make any difference. It's uh, that, that happens when you deal in proxy war. Maybe proxy war deals with you. I'll leave it at that. Jim, where's this all headed right now? Uh, who I, is it? In a matter of who blinks first? Well, it's a it's a matter of who runs out of uh, resources first, and the Iranians are in the worst shape, as it were, economically. The uh, the religious dictatorship, or what they did basically, was the Shah, the monarchy, owned a large chunk of the Iranian economy. You know, the, not just the Shah the royal family, but the the aristocrat, the aristocratic family, um, and they seized all of that. And rather than basically sell it off or whatever, uh, they basically. Uh, uh, took control of it um, as part of, uh, how should I put it, charities or, you know, uh, trusts. Uh, and as time went on, it became obvious that these trusts, their first uh, their first uh mission was to enrich the lives of the uh, the senior clergy and as the as the decades went by uh, you had the the princes and the princesses uh, flaunting their wealth uh, you know we see this and we see an example of this with uh, the Castro family in Cuba uh, the you know the internet bites back uh, one of the grandsons of Fidel Castro is quite the playboy and uh, he basically put a lot of pictures of himself partying in Europe and, uh, you know, at any place but Cuba, of course, um, and living it up. And uh, somebody leaked those. I mean, they were not for public, you know, consumption. Um, but uh, this became a huge embarrassment. Well, you've had more of that going on in Iran for longer. Um and this has been incredibly embarrassing. And so the, uh, you know, the senior religious families, not all of them, but most of them, uh, they're caught between, you know, cracking down on their own, you know, families, which is embarrassing, um, and uh, and trying to maintain the fiction that, oh, this is just foreign propaganda. It's the all the Israelis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The destruction done to the... Uh, uh, Iranian economy is not just from the uh, you know the religious leaders, but it's also the the how should I put it, the more radical factions of the um, of the, uh, the religious government, and that's the uh, in the as Austin describes it, the Re- regime uh, preservation force, the uh, IRGC, the uh, Re- Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, they were formed early on 
basically to keep an eye on the army, uh, which uh, was rebuilt, as it were, uh, purging all of the obviously pro you know monarchy, uh, uh, nationalist, communist, whatever, uh, you know, officers and what have you. But most Iranians are basically apathetic about it. You know, they they were told in the 1980s when they overthrew the Shah. They were going to get a, a pure democracy, and at the last minute, basically under the stresses, as it were, of the uh, uh, the Arab invasion, uh, which the religious leaders, uh, you know, who led the revolution against the Shah, turns to their advantage. Uh, they had, they basically modified the constitution, which was supposed to be, you know, purely, you know, uh, you know, uh, a straight democracy, uh, with a, 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 a how should I put it, a guardian council. In other words, a supreme. Uh, ruling body composed of senior clerics who could veto key decisions, like who could ter- who could stand for election, uh, you know, who could basically uh, take a, a government ministry, you know, when forming a government. Uh, and uh, this obviously was a sham uh, democracy because the people who had the ultimate power were not judges or you know the parliament, uh, but you know religious leaders. Uh, and they understood early on that they needed protection from possibly vengeful, uh, you know, Iranian public or especially the military. Uh, and they formed this, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a religious, you know, uh, you know, Republican Guard, as it were, type unit. Uh, and uh, this uh, operation, the IRGC and their Quds Force, they became more and more powerful as the, uh, how should I put the, the, uh, the religious government became less and less popular. Uh, they were the only force that was organized uh, with all sorts of you know, paramilitary forces uh, to suppress a, any popular uprising. It was also pointed out the 2009 uh, Green you know, uh, uprising was a protest against how the, uh, the, uh, the religious uh, dictatorship had rigged the elections. I mean, it wasn't enough to basically just decide who could run and who could not. But even a lot of the people they allowed to run turned out to be real Democrats and not, you know, uh, how should I put it, you know, useful tools of the religious dictatorship. And that was really scary. Uh, so it got pretty bloody uh, after '09, But now it's back again. And, uh, you know, the basically the, the rebels, the Iranian rebels, have uh, been able to think about this and come up with ideas. Um, and they have proven very, how should I put it, successful in avoiding the crackdowns that worked uh, so well in 2009. Uh, but their foreign wars are collapsing. In Syria, for example, the Israelis have carried out uh, hundreds of airstrikes. Uh, with, uh, they lost one airplane you know, but basically crash landed in Israel. Uh, uh, but they, the Iranians have not been able to touch them. Uh, the Russians are there, but the Russians do not want to go to war with Israel because, you know, the Israels have made it clear that they could basically embarrass uh, the Russian air defense systems. Uh, you know, they, they Israelis realized, hey, we might lose a few aircraft, but you're going to lose all your ex- export sales, or at least most of them, uh, because, you know, uh, proven in combat uh, will become disproven in combat. And, and of course, there's a long history to that, you know, uh, uh, Russian weapons in the hands of, you know, uh, uh, foreign, you know, uh, customers uh, failing uh, big time uh, when it comes to the crunch. Um, so the Russians have been very, how should I put it, you know, uh, e- e- equivocal about how much they're going to let their air defense systems and the Syrian air defense systems are all Russian. Mostly the ones the Syrian government has are mostly older generation, um, uh, you know, S-200, as, as is referred to, the more modern S-300 and S-400 systems. Well, the S-400 is only the Russians have in their two bases in uh, in western uh, Iran along the other coast. Uh, but they did give the, uh, the Syrians an S-300 uh, batteries, but they won't allow those to be used against the Israelis. With, and there's literally an understanding with Israel that if you carry out your attacks in a certain way, basically using standoff weapons and et cetera, there, it, I mean, this is not something that has been published, but it, it exists. Uh, you know, we won't interfere. Uh, and this is humiliating to the Iranians because the, the targets are always Iranian or Hezbollah. 
uh, and they happen every week, you know, several times a month. Uh, one of them on a on our weapons research, the Syrian weapons research center, which has been restarted, killed a couple of North Korean, you know, missile experts. That was embarrassing as all get out. Plus, a couple of other guys from the Russian scientists from Belarus, um, uh, which has which is you know one of the components of the Soviet Union broke away in in ninety one. Um, and uh, this is something that the Iranians can't do anything about. Uh, they can't stop the Israelis. In fact, they've literally pulled back. Uh, they were basically starting to move uh, proxy forces, Hezbollah, and, and with, along with a lot of uh, Quds Force and Iranian uh, officers and advisors and what have you, close so they could be right on the Israeli border, the Golan Heights. Well, that stopped. Uh, and the Israelis are basically humiliating them at every turn. Now, how can they destroy Israel if they can't even carry out proxy attacks? I mean, that's what it comes down to. You know, if you can't even zap them, you know, with your proxy forces, what kind of government are you? I mean, what kind of Iranian are you? Are you really worthy to run Iran? I mean, this is what it comes down to with the, uh, the religious leaders who for decades have said, God is on our side. We're Iranians. You know, we have God on our side. How can we lose? Well, now they're losing big time. And the Shia, the Syrian, uh, you know, base. Uh, an adventure, as it were, uh, intervention has been enormously expensive, and they've been forced to cut it back. In fact, it got so bad uh, this year, they, they cut, had to cut the subsidies to Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is now literally going out and soliciting donations uh, because they can't meet their payroll. Uh, one advantage of the uh, Iranian he- uh, proxy forces is they pay well. You know, they provide money, uh, uh, they provide uh, they provide fringe benefits. Uh, the Afghans uh, living in, uh, in, uh, in Iran or in exile were being pressured to leave, but they were told if, if one of their sons or, or husbands or a member of your family uh, joined the army, not only would he get like a thousand bucks a month, which is a big pay, paycheck, but uh, he would be guaranteed, you know, by medical care if he was wounded or, you know, maimed, uh, uh, crippled. And uh, and if he died, he'd get this uh, generous, by local standards, you know, a death benefit. And in addition, uh, wait for it, uh, the surviving family would get uh, residency permits in Iran and a uh, an apartment, a home, you know, uh, in other words, they'd be legal uh, in, in Iran, which is a big deal because who wants to go back to Afghanistan? And well, that's just another story. But anyway, they um, uh, they use this and uh, they basically had to pay for it. Literally, if you can't meet the payroll, you know, you're that's the trouble with mercenaries. If they're not paid, they can turn on you. Uh, and this is something Iran has always said, well, we can deal with it. Well, now they can't. Uh, the thing that hurt them the most, uh, which has been left out of our little, you know, uh, 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 discussion here, is fracking. Uh, the Iranians thought, they bought into the idea that the oil shortage, you know, was going to get real. Peak oil had been reached. Oil was become, going to become an enormously uh, expensive commodity, and they had a lot of it. Well, fracking showed that, whoops. Uh, now, the um, United States, in the space of a few years, is now an oil exporting country again. Uh, will soon be self-sufficient in petroleum, so nobody's going to be selling oil to the United States. And they have to worry about American, uh, you know, uh, salesmen running around the world saying, "Hey, we can supply you with, you know, liquid natural natural gas uh, and all sorts of, uh, you know, oil." Uh, for less than you've been getting from your uh, your normal suppliers in in Middle East or Russia or whatever, so the worm has turned. That hurt them probably more than anything else because it all comes down to the economy, economics, as the old saying goes. Well, since the 90s, yes, the economy's stupid, you know, when it comes to the economics. But it's been that way for a long, long time worldwide, and they cannot pay their bills. They have basically been living on a dream that the oil wealth. The, uh, would get more and more valuable as time went on, and suddenly in 2013-14, boom, in the space of a year, it fell by half. Now, if, when you depend a lot on those oil exports uh, you know, to maintain your lifestyle of your loyal population and your proxy armies throughout the region, uh, that comes as a huge blow, and it has not gone over well, uh, and uh, there's no way out of that. I mean, basically, there's no money. 
they pay for this. And when you can't pay for your mercenaries, what do your mercenaries do? Well, they don't fight, or in some cases, they turn on you. And so they're, they're basically facing both. They've had to pull back in Syria. Iraq has turned against them because, you know, as and we did an update the other day on Iraq. And, you know, um, blood is thicker than religion. And that's been proven time and time again. And uh, the uh, the uh, the pro the Iranian backed militias uh, in uh, Iraq and have become less and less loyal to Iran. More and more of them realize that, hey, these Iranians are our enemy. I mean, a lot of Iraqis say, look, we'd like to have a few thousand American uh, troops here, you know, basically uh, uh, to deal with the threat from the Arabs. I mean, as NATO cynically put it, or realistically put it during the Cold War, uh, we have we want American troops, you know, in, in Germany to keep the Germans down and the Soviets out and the French from taking control of the you know, organization. Uh, and, um, and that worked very well. Uh, but what happens when the Americans are no longer willing to pay for that? And that's what happened, you know, after the Cold War. Bang! You know, we just pulled those troops out. We threatened to pull them all out. Uh, and that's still on the table. Uh, but, you know, suddenly there's no Americans there to keep the Russians out. So it's not just an Iranian problem. It's a European problem. They played that game as well. But the thing is, Iran depended a lot on these proxy forces. The Europeans had their own armed forces, which they've mostly demobilized since the uh, Soviet Union fell apart. But they could, they could basically, and they're building them up again, uh, but they could basically uh, confront uh, their rush, the Russian threat. The Arabs have shown, as Austin you know, observed with the missiles and the technical training, the Saudis have been operating those uh, Patriot missile systems for decades now. I mean, you have old NCOs, senior officers, guys with great beards, who basically have spent their entire career maintaining and operating these systems. And that is scary to the Iranians because they, they're, you know, they're basically, their basic uh, attitude is these Arabs, you know, uh, Sandy Hill Billies, uh, they could never handle this modern technology. Well, they are. Also in Yemen, uh, the Arab, for the first time, Arab uh, air forces have been involved in a sustained air campaign uh, using smart bombs. Now, this is something that the Iranians really fear because they realize that if it ever comes to a war, the uh, the uh, Saudi and, and uh, UAE, well, the, the Arabian you know, oil uh, Arab oil uh, uh, air forces are much larger than the Iranian in terms of warplanes, but they're also much more modern with more, more uh, modern weapons. And the Arabs showed we can use these things. Um, so it's all falling apart. It was a house of cards, and you know a few cards got removed. One of them being the fracking, you know, the the oil, uh, the, the value of oil card, and it's all coming down at once. And they basically can't cope. And basically, the, 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 it's a panic at time because what can you do? You basically put off all of these problems. You know, the unhappy Iranians, the corruption you've ignored. Uh, and you've got more and more senior mullahs, more of these senior clerics who were never on board with the corruption. I mean, there were anti-corruption, uh, you know, senior clerics who were all for, you know, uh, let's destroy Israel, uh, let's take control of the holy places in Arabia, you know, Mecca and Medina, et cetera, et cetera. But they also were against the corruption. Now, they were they were also victims of 09, the crackdown. A lot of the uh, the the senior clerics who were were anti, you know, uh, our, our how should I put it? Uh, their, you know, the mob, the mobster attitude towards, you know, uh, taking uh, 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 public money for your own use, uh, they are basically, boom, pushed to the, the, the background. But they're coming out again because, uh, as Wilson pointed out, you know, senior officials are uh, also, uh, you know, against, you know, these bad habits. And they may be a minority, they may not have the power, but they're on the side of the majority, and the majority is no longer willing to put up with it anymore. And, of course, everybody is haunted by what happened to the communist governments in 1989 and 91. In the short space of three years, you know, all these governments collapsed. The people just said no more. 
And uh, and the army said, well, we're not going to shoot fire on them. Even the secret police they said, uh, oh, not us. I mean, you know, when you, when the people you in, uh, depend upon to fire on, uh, how should I put it, you know, the uppity, you know, the commoners, the revolting peasants, as it were, when they're not willing to fight, you're in big trouble. And that's what it's approaching right now. And, you know, as we've been pointing out, they've run out of moves. So, Look, like- Jim, let me I'm, make I'm, a I mean, this, this, could all, this could all end with a whimper. You know, the Soviet Union did not uh, end with a huge, you know, civil war and nuclear weapons and what have you. Uh, but you are dealing with that possibility. You know, you hope that it will end with just a, a, a basically low collateral, low collateral damage collapse. But uh, that's why uh, some Western countries, especially the United States, have been so intent on ensuring that the uh, the you know the Iranian government does not get nuclear weapons, because when they when that happens, then you've got a whole different ball game. Uh, you, uh, Jim, let me make a, a, a comment about the, the dissatisfaction, uh, anti-regime activity. You know, you leap from one a mild word to a to a revolution. Uh, some of the uh, of the most effective sustained uh, uh, sustained protests have been directed at deteri- uh, is- the issue of deteriorating infrastructure in uh, Iran. Uh, there are four or five major towns that have uh, constantly faced water shortages, and not just water shortages – contaminated water uh, issues. Now, several of those are in Western Iran, but they're not all, uh, they're, they're not, they're, there are other uh, examples of deteriorated infrastructure uh, throughout the country. And that, some of the corruption is tied to it, uh, neglect. The uh, regime, of course, blames American economic sanctions. American economic sanctions uh, exacerbate the, uh, in fact, is that there? There are. It's a wage, uh, the U.S. is waging economic war on the Ayatollah regime. I say it's high time we did it too, as effectively as we are now. But it's it's not the U.S. sanctions that have have created the situation. It's the regime that has cre- uh, created the situation. And your your discussion of Syria and, and Iraq. Uh, Syria is by far the most expensive mistake. Iraq is a mistake uh, as well. To some degree, Lebanese, Hezbollah, and Lebanon, and, and Yemen, uh, they're still expensive, but they, uh, they, they have not taken the resources. Uh, I'll put it this way. The regime put more resources into uh, uh, Syria and Iraq. Dan, I, I, I have been trying to think of what proxy forces the Iranians could possibly assemble to launch attacks on West Texas? Now that Jim points out that <laughs> fr- fracking is there, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm sorry, you know, I'm. Uh, 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 they're they're going to have a hard time finding proxy forces uh, out in West Texas. Well, aren't there some that they could recruit there in Austin that? Uh... Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, they're not going to be. Well, that's not, that's, Austin isn't Texas. It's just in Texas. Yeah. Uh, that those uh, Dan, uh, those those types that they would recruit here in Austin, Texas, don't stand a chance in West Texas. <laughs> they don't stand a chance in West Texas. Well, fracking, fracking has broken, Jim. Yeah, it really has. Literally well, and figuratively. we're uh, over time, so uh, we'll wrap it up there, and we'll talk to you gentlemen next time. Take care, bye. guys. All right, bye.